what makes it a good painting. And usually what makes it a good painting has nothing to do with the subject. I'm a real New Yorker. My father's also a real New Yorker. My mother was born in Boston. My father was a painter, so I hung out in his studio all the time. He was lucky to have family money, but also moving to Italy in 1961, and I mean, you couldn't avoid art. There was a, it was a really exciting moment for art in Italy, like arte povera, you know, and this kind of a whole different attitude toward art that was happening there in Europe. The spaces weren't these pure white spaces like here, everything was ancient. But I was in high school, I was, this is all kind of by osmosis, right? I was not completely understanding it, you know, the, la dolce vita that was going on around me. But later I realized I had ingested all this kind of, I, these ideas and they, Buri for instance, the artist or um, Fontana, people like that, that I saw then, but he wanted to see everything. So I would go with him to see things. And I think that's what inspired me in the end. When I went to Boston University, my first semester, I was studied Italian uh, literature. And that lasted one semester. And then I switched to the, <laughs> the art department. <laughs> I think abstraction is what always intrigued me, always. I had never seen America, so I had this funky little Camaro and drove it across country because I had a grant, a CETA grant, to do costume design for a dance company in Albuquerque. It was a whole bunch of New York dancers, the Albuquerque Dance Theater that moved out there, amazing, and they studied with John Cage, and they did a lot of work with chance in, in there. And so when I was designing costumes, I was also trying to work with chance. And that fed into, also started studying Tai Chi then with them. And it became the basis of my work ever since. But the concept is more that I trust the universe to bring me what I need when I need it. So there's kind of a ecology to it. How I found the thing I in, insert or apply or imprint may be chance. But once it's applied, you're done. That is a kind of absolute. You know, arriving in New Mexico and looking at the landscape and going, wow, this is abstract. You look out and it's, it's horizontal and then there's a giant butte sticking up that's absolutely pink and then it turns purple and then it, you know, it's like shocking. The earth is bright red and it goes for miles and, this, and the atmosphere is bell clear. You know, you, you can see for hundreds of miles. Mind blowing to see that much space after Europe where everything is layered and there's not anything that isn't covered with thousands of years of something else, you know? And you have to fit into that layered history if you want to do something, you're hanging on top of somebody else. So it was a matter of me thinking, hmm, I'm going to, you know, I started creating a, a way of traveling in that space. I created a game for making art, trying to figure out how many ways I could travel in this landscape, you know, so I created a whole bunch of images that were, came directly out of the landscape, but were completely geometricized and abstracted. I, having cleared out my father's studio on the Lower East Side, um, after he died, I had boxes of pigments and I never opened them for a long time because I wasn't interested in those colors. I was interested in electric colors like what's behind me on the wall there, more modern, more contemporary acrylic kind of colors. And what I inherited was a bunch of raw pigments from Rome in the 60s, which are ochres and you know, very natural earth pigment. Recently, they became important to me to use, but it took years before I opened that box. So first, there was that idea of, of place. I did for a long time these horizontal bands. 
ideas about color that have to do with transparency or opacity or gesture or how the color is applied or all the physical nature of it. When you see a certain color, it immediately suggests something. You have a lot of associations. We all do. But also the name, the, the name of color as a more conceptual place to be thinking about it. What it's called is very important, too. Some of it's historical, some of it's new, some of it's, you know, phalocyanine, which is newly humanly created, and some of it's ochre, which you dig out of the ground, you know. And it immediately gives it more meaning than just what it looks like on the canvas. You know, because when you're painting, you can't just keep painting forever. You wreck it, right? You can only do so much. I do a ground sometimes, and then I might make one stroke, which may have two or three strokes in it, but, you know, you, with, a, with a brush holder, I might make two strokes at once or five strokes at once, but it's one movement. That's it, and I'm done. But I want to keep painting, so I have to force myself to desist, stop, don't do too much, hold back. It's really hard for us to hold back and just stop at a certain point, because painting is fun. It's like writing a symphony where you have, you have rhythm, you have repetition, you have choruses coming back, you have colors repeating. You know, it, it's about dealing with time probably more than anything, because in looking at art and looking at painting, it, you really, you're talking about time. When I did my very first switch from horizontal, it was because I found this tool that was a, had five brushes all together on one handle. And it was a wood grainer, a French tool for faux bois. So it's actually very mechanical. The, that is another part of why I like repetition, so that I'm not doing this gesture that's a little too much like a kind of abstract expressionist gesture, but it's more of a gesture that comes out of a, a tool. It's an instrument and it helps you breathe. It helps you just not have so much ego involved in just the act of making something. Making wall drawings for years, we first of all got over scale and was able to do something big. So when I found this brush that could make five strokes at once. I thought, this is genius. Instead of working so hard to keep the strokes bound and, you know, making a, a postmodern image of a stroke instead of an actual stroke. And um, when I got to New York after, Baltimore, after New Mexico, Baltimore, came to New York and found out that LeWitt was doing stuff that was related to what I was interested in and happened to be lucky to get a job working for him. Um, that, you know, working on great big walls was so liberating. I mean, in a museum. So it freed me to feel like it's no problem. I could work any scale. The person who brought me in was Nancy Haynes, who's a dear friend and an amazing painter. And it took her twice. The first time she presented me, I was rejected because my work was too gestural because at that time, everybody was really hard edged. You know, it was like Mondrian's kids. And it was exciting. I mean, people, we had some screaming fights about art. Group would gather at usually um, Jim C. Wright's loft. We'd all be drinking and discussing and arguing and it would get pretty heated. Well, it was about abstraction. That was the issue. Now it's wide open. It's totally different. It's, a, it's really a haven. I feel just endlessly lucky that as an old lady, I can make art forever.